participating at Give India. He has spent three decades in the corporate space, building businesses globally, and led critical business and finance leadership roles at Genpact and Unilever. Welcome, Shantanu. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Shantanu. Okay, great. Thanks, Aurob. So, so our, to be here. our first panelist is Animesh Kumar. Animesh is president HR and transformation at Z Entertainment, leading people and transformation and driving diversity and inclusion. He is also closely involved in corporate responsibility for the organization, having previously served on boards working with nonprofit organizations. Animesh has over 30 years of experience in various roles across the HR function in large Indian and MNCs. A very warm welcome to you, Avinash. Thank you, Saurabh. It's Animesh, though, but thanks a ton for the anime. Uh, for the invitation. My bad. Apologies, and I hope you can pardon me for that one. Our second panelist is Devan Bhandari, partner, deal advisory, strategy, and restructuring at KPMG India. As the head of the business unit for KPMG Global Services Deal Advisory Practice, he is responsible for building organizational capabilities that efficiently and effectively support institutional support international deals, strategy, and restructuring engagements. Very glad to have you with us, Devang. Thank you so much, Saurav. Thanks a lot. Finally, our last panelist, Shaheen Dastur, is the head of corporate citizenship and CSR at City India. She's responsible for aligning, originating, and managing all non-profit relationships and activities. <laughs> and he has been responsible for charting City's CSR strategy across employability, financial inclusion and education, healthcare, art and culture, and environmental sustainability. Thanks for joining us today, Shaheen. For having us here today, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Saurabh. Okay. So the panelists are all on, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I better get out of here. Over to you, Shantanu. Wonderful. Hi, Shine. Um, just a request. There may be a little bit of echo coming from your mic. Okay. okay um, just give me a second. Okay. Let's just give Shine a, a few seconds to reset her mic and also possibly the camera. A is bit. this is this better, Shantanu? This is absolutely better. Okay. Great. Okay. And, and Shine, if I could just make one more request, uh, is there any way you can get the camera a little bit away from you so that we can see? Yes, your I'll, I'll try. Yes. Yes. Okay. Is this better? This is better. Absolutely. So, so thank you very much for agreeing to be part of the power panel. Um, you know, it's, it's great to have three corporates represented here. Um, Shine from City, Animesh from Z, and Devang from KPMG, who go beyond what is required by regulation in terms of their philosophy of institutional giving. Um, and all three of you in your individual choices of careers and how you sort of uh, divide your time have actually demonstrated your own conviction uh, towards the cause. So I'm going to drive right in and actually invite all three of you, and Shine, if I can request you to go first, to really give a very short view of how do you define your corporate's institutional giving philosophy. And the second part of that is, uh, given the fact that all of you have done way beyond during the COVID, has that in some ways changed or added facets to that philosophy? So Shine, go ahead first, please. And then maybe uh, Animesh and Devang, you can follow after that. Great. Thanks so much, Shantanu. And you know, thanks to the Give India team for having me here today. Um, so I joined City in 2007, and I took over as the head of this role in 2017. And as long as I remember, CSR has always been part of City's ethos. Um, I think in terms of our philosophy, uh, Shantanu, one of the key ingredients has always been enabling progress that is equitable. Um, since 2014, um, of course, with, uh, with the Companies Act coming into effect, 
we've really built and nurtured our programs. And so far, we've invested about 500 crores, impacting about 15 million people across low-income um, households across the country. Uh, I think there are two or three critical things that I would sort of bring to the fore when we talk about what, what we feel is distinctive about the way in which we do CSR. Um, I think first is uh, the spirit of innovation and thought leadership. Uh, I don't think that we've ever looked at it as philanthropy. Um, it's always been more a partnership between us and the nonprofit uh, community in terms of the way in which we create and design the programs. So I would say that's the first thing. The second, more interestingly, has always been um, to try and foster a sense of collaboration, which is why it was really interesting when I saw the, the, the sort of headline for the session today, I said, it really is quite intrinsic to what we do. Um, and very quickly, Shantanu, just to give you a sense of what that really means in terms of how we utilize this concept of collaboration, specifically even with regards to COVID, um, we really try to work not only within the nonprofit sector, but also within the public sector to try and stage these collaborations to ensure that the initiatives that we would forge would be holistic and they would have a very long lasting impact. Um, I'm just gonna to briefly touch upon a couple of them because um, I know that you know we still have to hear from Devang and Animesh as well. Um, but we launched at onset of COVID um, in 2021, uh, in 2020, sorry, we launched a ration program called You Nominate, We Donate. Um, the reason we did this was because at that time we had a lot of employees who wanted to do something. They felt a sense of despair. Everyone was at home. They, everyone was sort of locked down. And the You Nominate, We Donate initiative was, was, it was a way for us to really harness that collective spirit of the employee base of city. Um, and what employees had to do was nominate two families who had lost of mem who had lost sort of, you know, their livelihood, the earning member had lost their livelihood. And what we landed up doing is through multiple different partnerships, um, you know, across ration providers, so on and so forth, we provided over 850 tons of ration across the country. And so again, over here, we tried to bring in, you know, the, the, the sort of the spirit of the employee. Um, we, of course, had nonprofit partnerships with United Way, as well as, of course, with food providers to help execute this program. At the same time, we also forged a partnership on testing and we created this program called Project Umi. Um, and this was a time at which, you know, um, RT-PCR testing was something that, you know, was pretty hard to get done across Maharashtra. Again, over here, Shantanu, we were able to administer over 115,000 tests across Maharashtra, the 15 to 17 government hospitals across Maharashtra in partnership with the state municipal corporations, as well as with Metropolis Labs being the diagnostic partner. Sipla came on board as our knowledge partner and United Way came on board as sort of our, you know, our overall governance partner. Again, over here for us, I don't think this would have been possible if we didn't have at the heart of it this, this sense of collaboration um, to get sort of to the end, the end um, beneficiary. More recently, uh, when we when the sort of the second wave came upon us, there was a lot of there was a lot of hesitation about people taking vaccines from low income backgrounds. This was also around the same time that the supply of vaccinations were very sort of limited. What we did at that time was we partnered with the municipal corporations of both Mumbai and Navi Mumbai, um, as well as with Just Lok Hospital and Research Center. And what we landed up doing is we've administered in just in just over two months, we've administered about two lakh vaccinations to people from low income households, of which about 19,000, 90,000 are from people from Dharavi. Um, this again is sort of, you know, demonstrative of the spirit of co collaboration. So yeah, I think at, at the heart of everything um, that we've done, I think it is this, this concept of coming together in a certain sense that has sort of helped us in our trajectory up until now and also as we move forward. Um, I'll just end by saying, I think we collectively have great potential um, as Corporate India uh, to work with the social sector, to work with the public sector. And I think COVID, if there's one thing that the pandemic has taught us is how we can actually pivot to the future. And I, I mean, I don't think there could be a better title for this. And, um, you know, I think this is definitely the way forward as we, as we move ahead in terms of this space. Thanks.
Thank you, Shine. I think you brought to life the the phrase together, which we think is going to be one of the cornerstones of the whole institutional giving model uh, for India and for Give India for sure. Animesh, if I can request you to go next uh, for the same question in terms of the philosophy of Z and how it's evolved with COVID as an experience. Uh, thank you, Shantanu, and uh, Give India for inviting me for this uh, this uh, panel discussion. Uh, uh, Shine's uh, laid out a really uh, comprehensive template that cities followed. Uh, I think most corporations, uh, including us, we've had a very similar approach. Uh, but philosophically, uh, Shantanu, uh, our, uh, our approach has been anchored in a belief system that goes beyond just uh, impact and philanthropy. Uh, Hindi mein jise kehte hain ki uh, hum hi hum hai to kya hum hai? Tum hi tum ho to kya tum ho? Extraordinary together, and that's been the uh, the anchor uh, that has driven just about everything that we do within the organization, and that's also been the uh, the uh, the driving principle of how we'd approach the uh, the COVID piece. I think the other thing that's been uh, uh, that we had uh, incorporated into our program, and uh, I wanted to pick up from Mr. Ramadurai's uh, statement that the state, the the nation state in almost every country, but definitely in India, is the largest provider of social goods of uh, of making sure that uh, in this case, public health infrastructure is the is really been the uh, the arm that has really anchored and delivered our COVID response across the country. And it's done a very, very spectacular job. I think what came to life uh, during this entire COVID uh, scenario, phase one, phase two, and everything in between that we all went through has been this, uh, the success of this tri partnership between corporations, uh, philanthropic slash impact organizations and public uh, public health infrastructure in this case. And why this, I think, this concept that uh, Give India has put together, which is uh, better together, why it is so seminal is if we can replicate the successes of how we responded to the pandemic in other aspects, I think there is an opportunity to have a colossal impact on various other parts of, uh, uh, of what's required in, uh, in our social construct, whether it's in education, whether it's in skilling, and any number of other areas. I don't want to uh, lay out a whole list. So to bring it back, uh, we're very focused on empowering others to around us to lead a better life, and that is that that is really uh, encapsulated in that term extraordinary together. Let me hand that back to you, Shantanu. And... No, thanks a lot, Animesh. And I think, you know, the extraordinary together really resonates and we'll, we'll sort of unpeel that a little bit later. So Devang, if I can hand over to you with the same question, uh, go ahead. Please. Sure, sure, Shantanu. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so, um, just at a high level, right, uh, to get the formal part out. So our focus for KPMG globally is very much on SDG4, which is the quality education. Um, but in India, we actually take a much wider spectrum of that, which is starting from the early childhood education to um, lifelong learning, uh, including livelihoods and skilling. So it's a much wider spectrum, what we take as an approach. Um, now, uh, you know, coming to uh, the specific insights and some of the, uh, you know, which some of the themes which came up in COVID. So, I mean, uh, Shine talked about it, Animesh talked about it. I mean, the corporates have done an amazing job in terms of sort of coming together. Um, and, and, uh, and by the way, better together is actually one of our key values, which is exactly those two words. So I, I, I can relate to this much better, at least from a KPP standpoint. Um, but yeah, so the corporate sort of, you know, obviously came together very well as, as the, as the, um, the event unfolded, right? The pandemic unfolded. Uh, there were three things we said we're going to really focus on. Okay. The first one 
was really around the support required to ensure that our social enterprises, the ones we partner with, can sustain through this period. So I think um, even though the program sort of had a big impact, we wanted to make sure that we're providing adequate support to the enterprises who are actually been in this for many years. And you know, we don't want to we want to ensure that they don't break away as a result of this impact. So I think that was number one. Number two. Um, was very very clearly focused on contributing uh, you know augmenting the infrastructure around covid uh, healthcare um, and that too again in fact um, uh, you know we partnered with give india worked with the delhi government sort of really uh, worked around the oxygen infrastructure and so forth so there were a lot of activities which happened around that uh, so that was i think the second and then the third was really around programs focused on the uh, severely impacted population for us, I think in that case, uh, it was really a but also the second phase. So all of that you know, really continued. And and um, of course, our, our professionals across KPMG in India, through the monetary and all the other uh, you know um, efforts, organized rations and uh, you know, all the activity, which I'm sure all the other corporates have done. I, I would just want to sort of recap, I think four key points or key insights um, which I think are interesting, which I you know would love to share, and of course hear your and our panel's view. Panel's view. The first one is really uh, around that the relief work requires high high amount of coordination, which is why this term "better together" is so critical. Because you know, um, especially during at this time, the CSR partners, I mean CSR, the corporate should come together and partner with each other. I mean, I remember even during the work which we had done during Kerala floods, right? And, years ago, I could see a, a plethora of amount of high amount of wastage in terms of food and truth. So clearly, I think, again, a platform like Give India can play a, a critical role here. So that's point number one. Point number two is actually, uh, you know, um, animation also talked about it, Shine talked about it. It's more important than ever to engage with the government and the administration machinery. I think for us as corporates, because if we have to ensure that the impact is being created where it's needed the most, we have to work together. It should not be just as a rubber stamp to say we've done something, but more in terms of coordination. That really uh, brings impact to life. Number three is really around relief attracts much faster and higher amount of cash inflows as compared to rehab. And that's where I, I think we as CSR have to recognize the importance of rehab. And, and interestingly, given some of the changes, and we can, I think, explore this a bit in, uh, you know, as we go on, some of the changes enabled by the new law, CSR law, can actually help innovate operating models for the um, social enterprises so they can actually integrate the relief and rehab all together as a package and come to corporates as you sort of, you know, right at the time when relief is needed, but then of course rehab needs to follow. So I think though that's the, I think the third, third big one. And then the last but not the least is really around, like in startups, right? The most important element of social enterprise is its management team and the larger organization capability, which means um, how quickly they innovate. I mean, something like this sort of really put the entire emphasis back onto the capability of the management teams and the, the social enterprise and the larger capability, uh, organization capability to say, how do you adapt yourself to the constraints you've got? And, and interestingly, I'm really, really glad um, um, as an advisor, as well as as a CSR uh, professional, is that the government has sort of really clarified what the administrative overheads are to ensure that it doesn't sort of become a really narrow way of looking at it. So my actually humble appeal to corporates, to this channel is going to be is, think about the managed capability in a much bigger and a better way as an investment as opposed to typical overhead of the agency. So, Kind of those are, I think, the four really key takeaways for us as we as we sort of are dealing with the COVID. Devang, thanks a lot for that. That's a very good summary. You know, I'm going to actually make this a little provocative now because I think, you know, we all believe that corporate India and not just corporate India, corporate India foundations, high net worth individuals across the board um, really went up over and beyond during COVID. Uh, not only in terms of how much money they put in, but also the way they collaborated, which is this whole theme of togetherness, the way they came together and the speed and the agility of decision making and the trust they put in, in the delivery system and intermediaries to get things done. Um, 
So the question I have, and I, I would encourage you to wear not just the hat of your organization, but it's a slightly broader organization. And Devang, I'll start with you being the consultant uh, in, in the room, uh, apart from me. Uh, but uh, <laughs> saying that, how, how does this sustain without the stimulus of a crisis? Because, you know, COVID hopefully will be under control. All of us, you know, touch wood. Um, but the, the problems of India haven't diminished. If anything, they have only increased manifold. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, this needs to happen much more. So, would, could you start and say, okay, if you were to wear the hat of saying, okay, we did a super job. You know, it's like we scored tons of runs in the last 10 overs. But how do we do that for the next 50 overs? Yeah. So, um, since you've asked a provo provocative question, I'll also have a provocative reply to that, which sure. is, which, which is, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, in a crisis, the impact comes out very tangibly, and and very quickly. So the you know, so then people, I mean, whether it's foundations, corporates, I think they feel sort of good about what they're doing, which is which is the right thing to do, but the impact return is much faster visible as opposed to having that longer patience of, you know, getting through sustainably through a program. So that's, I think that's where the, the issue which, you know, we start with. Uh, there is a whole lot of amount of education which needs to be done at a board level, uh, you know, at a management level across the, the entire ecosystem uh, uh, with the key stakeholders and the role they need to play. Um, if I were to just take a step back and look at uh, just, and, and again, this is, I'm just sort of comparing some of the policy narratives, right? If you look at from a government standpoint, I think some of the areas where the government has really excelled is again, trying to do some things which are very time bound and targeted. And that's been where our scheme is successful. I think the ones which takes time, it's unfortunately, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And which is where I think we need to sort of start to change that momentum. Luckily, I, I guess what COVID, the civil lining of COVID is that people have there are two things. One, the governments themselves have realized, whether the state government or the union government have realized the importance of the partnership between private and public sector. So that, I think, hopefully will in, will lead to a better environment to sort of work in, even for the longer term projects, which then, the, the, uh, which sort of becomes attractive for, um, you know, corporates and others to sort of really participate in. That's number one. And number two is, I think, just within the corporates themselves, and I think with now the law coming in place with a zero plus three, right? So I, I, I look at this as a four-year journey. Uh, hopefully now with the better education, we can try and take a lot better impact-oriented outcome-related uh, projects as opposed to, you know, the once in a while sort of, a, you know, a project. So I think that's kind of my submission. I think it is not an easy answer, but I think the conversations need to have started and I think they need to really sustain which is where the private-public partnership is required. Uh, corporates need, need to see what environment is given to public uh, by the public by the government uh, in terms of enabling them to sort of really bring that impact. And equally, uh, boards need to get uh, educated in terms of what you know how we can apply the CSR in the spirit of um, the impact outcomes, which is becoming a lot more important now than what it has been previously. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Devang. Animesh, can I request you to add to that? from your perspective, and also wearing that larger hat of, you know, even other corporates as you think about this. So I think there are multiple uh, layers to be unpeeled on this, Shantanu. If you look at it from a classical demand supply, and let's just take the framework for demand side uh, challenges that we have. Uh, in the impact slash uh, philanthropic sector, there are three issues that I think we need to solve for or address. One is uh, capacity building. Uh, and nested in that or a counterpoint to that is the whole issue of scale. We have very large number of uh, institutions and, uh, and uh, trusts and other corporate board, uh, other architecture that is uh, involved in delivering philanthropy or making impact. But they are at, there aren't really any large scale institutions that are able to build capacity for absorbing the amount of money that potentially is available for deployment in this space. Also, when you build a certain size and scale, you bring institutional ecosystems into, uh, into the sector, 
which are then able to better manage, deploy, and bring the discipline of management that you and a lot of us have really uh, trained in uh, into the space. And I think Give India and Atul and many others are doing an exceptional job in driving that. So there is capacity and scale, which are really, uh, I think, uh, key areas that need to be addressed. The other one is, uh, and I know that this is uh, uh, this is uh, controversial uh, to a little bit, but it's something I very deeply believe in that we are only looking at a very large number of people look at this entire sector from the lens of doing good rather than making impact. I think doing good is a given. Uh, and doing good is... Uh, is uh, is important, but for to move beyond doing good, to be able to demonstrate impact will allow institutions in the impact and uh, philanthropic sectors to draw on many other pools of capital and not just philanthropic capital. So today, the only focus or the only capital pool that we are deploying in this area is uh, philanthropic capital. But there are many other forms of capital that are available, which will become much more accessible as you get into going, moving away from doing good to making impact. Because then the, the a lot of the discipline of measurement, uh, return on capital, social uh, return on investment, various other metrics start to come into play. So that's, in my view, a demand side address that we need to do. On the supply side, I think we have basically just tapped the capital part of uh, of what is available from corporates. Corporates have an incredible ability to bring capability to play. Unfortunately, the current format, and uh, again, why I'm very why I bring this into uh, into the conversation right now is because uh, uh, we're working with Give India to experiment on uh, uh, in a format where private capability, and I'm using private in a generic sense, is being brought to bear in government uh, institutions and to see if those capabilities can be used to enhance the impact that government schemes make. We are doing this experiment specifically in Karnataka uh, with Give India through their IEF program, which I think is a huge opportunity for creating a completely new way of bringing capability into play. But capability need not just be long-term deployment. And I think there's an opportunity to create a marketplace where capability, whether it is for a specific project or on a certain amount of employee giving or personal giving that you want to do, various formats, time lengths, and other variables can be brought into play where if we can leverage the capability that exists in corporate India, then that could be a very large uh, uh, driver of much bigger impact in this space. Let me stop there, Shantanu, and hand it back to you. No, thanks, Animesh. I think there are two fundamental thought processes between you and Devang, which you've teed up, which is this whole thing about impact. And I think there are many layers of impact that we need to talk through, and we'll, we'll at least touch on that. And the second is an interesting dynamic between capacity building and also leveraging capability from the corporate side. So we'll come back to that. Shine, one point which Animesh mentioned, if I can uh, ask you to elaborate because of not just City India, but City Global experience that you have, which is this concept of getting capital from outside into the sector, you know, through innovation, innovative mechanisms and structures and stuff like that. And I know City has done some stuff on that. Could you just give us a little bit of sense of how City thinks about that and, and looks at it? Apart from obviously also as answering the question as to how do we sustain the momentum beyond crisis? Thanks. So thanks, Jantanu. I think um, I think both Animesh and Devang brought up very interesting aspects. Um, for us at City uh, globally, um, there are two sort of different facets through which I would say we've leveraged funding towards social good um, in terms of impact. Right. Once one is through the environmental and social risk framework that we have created globally, uh, wherein based on certain parameters, um, City decides to you know, go or not go forward with any kind of project financing. So that again is, you know, way more and you know above and beyond philanthropy in any sense, where you actually have a project finance risk team that evaluates, you know, proposals based on 
the positive slash negative impact on the environment. So there is a lot of that globally that's going on. There are a lot of global bonds that we have obviously entered into with regard to climate change. Um, most recently, we've also invested in social impact bonds globally. Um, and that is something that is quite interesting. Again, this is not something that obviously comes out of the philanthropic um, budget or is even part of the foundation's mandate, um, but is actually completely separate and different vertical. Um, for us in India, which is, you know, which is kind of an interesting, you know, when we talk about what other sources there could be, and I know Animesh spoke about um, the supply side and, you know, additional sort of facets that could sort of come to play. Um, I had a, you know, my, my sort of point on this is slightly more layered from a governance perspective, and that's where I'd like Devang to kind of put in his two bits, is that when you're looking at the MCA and the Companies Act as it stands today, um, is there scope for us to really invite additional supply side sort of sources of funding to help in this? Because I think Animesh put it very well when he said, doing good is a given. It's really about creating lasting impact. And I think that's kind of what we need to see because sustainability and philanthropy sometimes is counterintuitive. When you have something which has, when you treat this more, you know, as the act of doing a business, but in the social sense, I think that is actually where you get a return on your investment. There's a different kind of stakeholder engagement than then comes through from everyone across the board. And, you know, so for me, I think when I look at it from this perspective, I do think that the recent regulations and amendments, um, if structured differently um, or sort of elaborated a little more, would have the potential to galvanize additional sources for us to sort of work with as we move forward. So, so Shine, I think that's a that's a good point, and I'm actually going to reframe that question a little bit with you, if if it's okay with you. Um, and part of the reason why you know Givinda is so intent on creating this capacity is actually to encourage and allow for different people to come in, whereas and create those collaboratives and and drive those. And there are a whole bunch of examples right now, either in implementation or in design. Uh, without necessarily the regulations allowing an individual company or an individual CSR to sort of uh, do that. But the reframing question on that really, and Animesh, if you can go for a quick round and then Devang will follow up with you, is, is, is the new CSR amendment proposed rules and guidelines, the sort of 1991 moment of the Indian economy that now uh, the animal spirits, or in this case, maybe that's a wrong term, is going to be out and we can sort of really see the acceleration of driving scale and impact and capacity building from the corporate side, or is there a lot more which needs to be done? I think uh, it's a good start, uh, Shantanu. Uh, I still think that uh, we, the fact that capacity building for the NGO, not just for end use deployment, is still treated as part of administrative expenses in a, in a construct is a challenge. Because from my experience, there is the availability of resources, the availability of capital is not a constraint. Uh, capital is available quite generously. Uh, for different uh, interventions that you want to drive. The absorptive capacity of the sector, I think, needs to be strengthened. And the one way to strengthen that, which I think the law has moved a few paces, but it could probably go a little further, would be to include the fact that when you want to spend money, if as a corporate I want to spend money, capacity enhancing an NGO, and uh, so that you know, their ability to drive end use impact is significantly amplified, uh, is still not is still not completely free or is still not treated as CSR. That's an area that I would love to see some more flexibility in. But you're right. I think the law has moved in the right direction. Devang called it out that it's there have been steps going in that direction. Hopefully uh, this trajectory will continue. Devang? 
Yeah. Um, no, so totally, completely agree with Animesh. Uh, my answer is going to be in a typical consultant style, yes and no, in terms of whether it's moved the needle. Um, but but I have a fair answer to that. So the, the yes is, of course, I, I think the entire development sector, I mean, just from a CSR standpoint, I think we're screaming to say, you cannot look at a project on a yearly basis. It just doesn't make sense, right? So you need to have a... In fact, I I, I'm, I would say actually the law probably stopped short of actually making it five years. I think ideally it should have been a five-year thing as opposed to, you know, the, the zero plus three. But, um, but nevertheless, I think that demand is finally met. Um, having said that, there are, you know, there are a bunch of things we can, can be done. Uh, unfortunately, I, you know, the... The complication we have to sort of work with and the constraint we have to work with is that our laws don't speak to each other. So our CSR law will, will do something, but then the tax law will not speak to it. The SEBI regulations will not speak to it. So then you sort of, if one, allow, one law allows you to do something, you then get stuck in your you know tax law or you, can, you get stuck in SEBI uh, regulations. So, so. so there is a bit of that challenge which we have to still navigate. Um, so there is, if uh, that's number one. Number two is, um, I think, see, uh, the law amendment has come, which was sort of had to be done. It maybe hopefully you know maybe three years or four years ago. But having said that, I think it needs to catch up very very fast. There are really innovations which are happening now. We are sort of involved in some of these impact bond structuring in India, and uh, oh boy, what what an experience! I mean, it's just. Uh, you know, trying to figure out a boilerplate actually to make it work so that the trans at the transaction cost level, that goes down. So it becomes a lot more attractive for uh, donors, for foundations, for everybody to sort of get, get in. is sort of is something what my ideal dream is. But uh, we're trying to, sort of trying to get through that, right? Um, but that's the second bit. The third thing which we haven't talked about, which I would definitely want to just put a pointer here, is the entire social stock exchange. And what's happening with social stock exchange? I think it can play a phenomenal role in actually providing that uh, enabling platform for a lot of the NPOs, right? I mean, they talk about okay, NPOs can register with, with the, the social stock exchange. If you've seen the last report which came out of the committee, uh, I think that can be a fantastic platform, to, you know, uh, to Shine's point around governance. The governance can grow multifold with one agency sort of really taking that uh, role. I would actually not even stop there. I would say, look, you know, after that, uh, introduce rating mechanism to rate the uh, uh, the social enterprises. It's similar to the commercial market discipline. Let's have that discipline here as well. So that's one. It sort of attracts more people to come in. The supply side, as animation said, is not an issue. The thing, however, is how to channelize that supply side effectively in compliance with the law is an issue. Uh, on the, on of course, on the absorption side, clearly we need to see a lot more innovation coming in, which is where I think um, building that capability. Um, you know, the, the CSR law used to allow corpus contribution that has gone away. That's very clearly said no. So there are some things we still need to uh, manage with, but uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's a step in the good direction, but there are there's lots to. Do. Okay, wonderful. Um, look, I think, you know, this kind of a topic, we can continue for many, many more minutes and many hours, actually. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of summarization. I've been looking at some of the questions. I think we have addressed a bunch of them in different ways, like for what, what are the other ways we should think about beyond COVID? How, how about capacity? I think there's a very interesting question, which I would have loved to take, which is, has this fundamentally changed, uh, you know, the, the thought process in employees' mind, but maybe we'll just keep it separately uh, on that. Just from a summary perspective, look, I think the way I would I would characterize where we are today is that there is no sector in the economy, there is no enterprise which is completely devoid of regulatory cholesterol, as 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 uh, some one leader put it, right? So I think we can keep thinking about regulatory cholesterol and say, okay, till we get to hundred percent, you know, zero percent cholesterol is when we sort of drive. But I think the excuses are off the table now. So I, it, between the corporates between the intermediaries uh, like give india and between the delivery organizations and the government this is the time for us to get creative in how we think about design this is the time when we really put the focus and the anti up on impact as opposed to effort 
and then the whole question of together which is the which is part of the better part of the uh, equation and then together which is how do we leverage on the total amount and then make the synergy work right and that total amount then allows us to do more creative stuff of getting money from not just philanthropy but from other sources whether it's corporate whether it's high net worth individual whether it's even individuals employees everywhere which may or may not have otherwise come into the sector at that point in time so i think um i'm i'm the the takeaway for me from this conversation is that you know the ball is squarely in our court and it's up to us to make that happen so thank you very much for joining we really enjoyed you having having uh, having you on the panel uh, and it was absolutely wonderful to learn uh, the different nuances and the different insights that you shared with us thank you very much over to you saurav thank you shantanu for a thank lovely you. facilitation thanks lord sir thanks thanks shantanu well thanks so much shaheen animesh devang and shantanu for that super engaging session i think there were just so many perspectives and insights and a lot of takeaways for all of us in that conversation i can't even point out any in particular and i think shantanu you summarized it well